let me open up. So today, um, October 5th, St. Faustina, she's known as St. Maria Faustina, Kowalska, she was taken to heaven because she's beatified, she's canonized, we know she was taken to heaven, we can say that for sure. The church made a statement. So, so today, 1938, uh, St. Faustina passed away. She was born in 1905, so at the very beginning of the 20th century. She was born to a family of 10 children. She was a third of the, of the 10, so she had older brothers and sisters. Her father was a farmer plus a carpenter. She did, he did some carpentry. His mother was a housewife, but also took care of the farm. So we have a setting here. When Faustina was born, this is just before World War I, when um, she was barely nine years old. As you know, World War, World War I began. They closed all the schools, so there's nothing. Uh, so she could not really go and receive formal education. She tried to, in the afterwards, after World War I, when the schools were formed, but she felt she was really too old, and the schools were so small, they said, you know, make room for the young kids. You know, you know all of you who are older, well, you've got to make up in whatever ways you can. So she lacked formal education. But, but, the fact is this, whatever she learned within those first one and a half years, she learned quite well, because her handwriting was pretty good, actually. She misspelled words, it showed a lack of education, but you know what, I've seen people in college, after college, they still misspell words. <laughs> yes. It's right. an indication of anything. That's why we have to have dictionaries all over the place. But the fact is that it's not just an indication of something, she did lack formal education. The second aspect was that uh, she was, according to her parents and according to the memories of her brothers and sisters, she was a really good kid, who can say that. She was someone who, uh, who made sure that she practiced her faith. Uh, it is kind of interesting that she was not able to go to Mass every Sunday. You may already know that. She was not able to do it because the only the girls had only one dress, a nice dress, and they felt ashamed of going to mass in a dress which was not properly or appropriate for Sunday, Sunday best. And so the, the daughters would take turns, and so they would use the same dress to go. And when she was not able to go to mass, she would um, stay at home and she would hear the bells. At that time, during the consecration, the church bells would ring. And so she would know exactly when the time of consecration came, and so she would pull herself aside, either to a garden or to some corner of the house, and she would pray. She would be uniting her heart with, with, with the Lord. And this is something that she picked up from her family. She didn't pick it up from just anyone, but from her family. This is how things were done. Maybe if you were a boy or so and you were not exactly thinking about practicing your faith, you kind of run away, maybe you weren't exactly praying. You maybe go someplace else, who knows, but she really took it seriously. I think the Lord's grace was always there in her heart. When she was seven years old, she experienced for the first time a type of awareness of Christ's presence in the Eucharist. This was in the, uh, she was in church, it was an exposition of Blessed Sacrament, and she speaks of that moment as a moment of awareness of Christ's presence. We do not know exactly what it means, how a child experiences, but we can go back to our own, you know, age, maybe it was seven or eight, whenever we were children, uh, and maybe we can kind of reconstruct some of the awareness, but we know that it was not just uh, something that was uh, so humanly known, because she said there was some extraordinary moment that must have been a special grace that she received. When she was a teenager, she was nothing unusual. Um, she was a good girl. She uh, wanted to help the family, so she went out to work. Uh, she was like a, you know, like a nanny or so. She would take care of families. And this way she would bring income to the family. 
As a matter of fact, when she asked her parents whether she could join religious communities when she was 16 years old, 16, 17, her parents said, well, we can't, we can't let you go, literally. Uh, secondly, the father said, well, I can't sell a cow because there was a need for a dowry, meaning that you would bring some gift to a religious community when you were joining. It was, it was kind of accustomed to, be, to, to do that. And so basically the parents blocked her from even considering religious life, uh, both as an economic uh, element for them. They had a lot of smaller children and they needed additional help, financial aid. And, uh, and so, so they were not really willing to do that. So finally she decided that if her parents are not allowing her, that she would just kind of forget the whole thing, you know? Try, the way she describes in her diary, she says that, she says, I tried to sort of put away from my awareness uh, the concept of call, God's call, just kind of just be normal like everybody else is, is, is normal. And so part of being normal is you go to a dance, you know, to enjoy. So she went to a city, uh, went to a dance. It was like one of the, uh, uh, you know, after the harvest season, special type of, a, you know, a, you know, a dance playing, people enjoying eating, whatever. You might have seen that movie where she, you see her at the dance, you know, and she is there. She's kind of dressed in a sort of, in, according to the movie, in a, in a folk costumes, but they didn't have that. She probably just wore something normal, you know, but the movie wanted to access it to, to, to influence us. So she probably wore something that looked like a folk dress, uh, but probably not. But anyway, what happened during the dance is so powerful that it created um, a mission for her whole life. And she saw Jesus there, which um, maybe is something customary in Poland, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, where you see Jesus' face as a scourge face or someone who's sitting like in a, in a, in a posture of scourging. So she sees this face of Jesus and she sees a face full of pain, suffering, blood, shut eyes, um, you know, sweat, spitting, and she sees that face, and Jesus says to her, how long am I to wait for you? How long are you gonna put me off? And she understood these words very clearly. She knew what they meant. She wanted to put away her vocation. She didn't want it to have uh, she didn't want it to even think about it, the call. And, and so here we have an experience of some young lady who realizes there's, there's something going on here. I mean, this experience was so powerful to her, it was so powerful that she was not able to any longer rationalize it away, argue it away. And immediately after that, she just packed up her very small belongings, which actually was really nothing not even a, a change of clothing, and she took off and went to Warsaw. Uh, because what happened is that when, uh, when she, uh, she immediately after this experience, she ran into the church and basically said, what am I supposed to do? She turned to her Blessed Mother and says, you have to help me, I don't know what to do. And then she heard the interior voice go to Warsaw, there you will join the religious community. And so that's why she went to Warsaw. Now she goes there and she says she doesn't know what to do. She's afraid, it's a big city, uh, almost two million people. Uh, I guess you, you go to somebody, you know, you're not going to visit your relatives or anyone. So once again, guess where she goes? To church. After the experience of seeing Jesus, she runs to church, then goes to Warsaw and says, Lord, here I am, you've got to help me. I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. Where to go? And the next best thing is that if you go to church and there's mass, there's always a priest there. So then she turns to a priest after mass and says, um, she summarizes, I do not know how, but she says she received something from the Lord and she wants to join a community. And the priest says, well, I just happen to know a family, they're looking for a nanny, maybe this will be a good start for you. At least you have a place to, uh, to stay, a roof, a roof over your head. And, and you know, can you imagine in her own heart wanting to do the Lord's will, not knowing what to do, 
turning to our Blessed Mother, asking for help. And then Blessed Mother to the priest, who, after the Eucharist, gives her what she needs. She gives her a place to stay, a place of work, and then place an opportunity for her to follow through. And so there she is, she gets a nice job, and the lady says, well, oh, you're a really great girl, you know? So she started looking for a husband for her. <laughs> uh, she was really great with kids. You know, the people who actually witnessed her, she says she was uh, smiling, she was a redhead. Can you imagine redhead with fluffy hair? You know, there's pictures of her. We just don't think in her, of her in that category. But she was very, very uh, pleasant to be with. Happy disposition. Uh, she used to sing along, you know, how many people sometimes sing in the kitchen, doing things, you know, especially in the environment of, you know, our Baptist friends are a little bit better, Baptist ladies are a little better, they sing even better than we do, but at any rate, she used to do that, and, uh, and so she, she was singing songs, this one song that became very typical for her is later on, and I'll talk about that in the Eucharist, because I have to give a homily, so I'm going to talked about the Eucharist and, and some of the aspects of her, her life, so I will not repeat myself. But, um, but she sang this song, the Eucharistic song, and this lady said, you know, I remember her singing this song more frequently than other songs, these hymns, church hymns. And it's very powerful, and as I said, I'll keep you in suspense here until, <laughs> until, until I get to Mass, so you make sure that you go to Mass. <laughs> <laughs> Which I have no doubt you will. Because <laughs> that's what you came here for. Uh, but, uh, so, there she is, and she began to look for religious communities. You know, uh, her, um, you know, her employee, uh, 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 employer uh, wanted to make sure that she get married, but she has other ideas. And so she starts looking for communities. Many of the communities turn her down as being nothing special, meaning, you don't have education, you don't have any, you know, type of profession. Uh, what can you do for us, you know? You know, today we would say get a GED, you know, get, you know, at least high school diploma equivalency, see what we can do with you. You know, just like Don Calloway when he joined us, he didn't have a high school diploma and, and we had to ask him, he said, can you get a GED first before we even consider you? Yeah. You know, but, so, so she walks, walks up to various communities and she's nothing special until she goes to a, a community which eventually she joins and they're the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy, Mother of Mercy. And there um, the, the lady, the sister who actually uh, meets her, uh, she looks at her and evaluates her from a very human perspective and says, you know, yeah, well, poor girl, not much on her and whatever. But, but, and this is very important, but she said to her, go to the chapel, ask the Lord, will he accept you? Very powerful words. You know, when you ask the Lord for a special uh, request, make a special request, you ask him for special grace, God is the one who provides. And, and so there she is, and she asks Jesus, Jesus, the master of this house, do you accept me? Do you accept me? And she hears inside of her heart that he does. Yes, I do. I do accept you. Once again, um, I do not know what was going through her heart, through her mind, but she maybe she says, okay, maybe this was it, but now I've got to talk to the sister whether she accepts me. And, uh, and, and, uh, and the sister says, so what did the Lord say to you? And she must have said it with maybe trembling heart, I do not know. But she says, yes, he accepted me. Okay, so what we have here is, is God working through humanity, human beings like all of us are here and working towards a particular type of mission. So there she is, she joins the community at the age of 20. And do you know that she was living in religious life for only 13 years? I've been in the community for 33 years. I know what, what that means. You know, 13 plus 20, you know? And, and I cannot say that I have done anything. I, I really haven't done anything. And look what she was able to do within this 13 year period of her life. 13 years, it's not much. 
13 year of her, years of her life. And so what we have here is extraordinary grace of God working in her heart. From the very beginning, yes, it was an unusual situation when she was drawn to God by that vision that she had. But she said yes to everything. It was her yes. You know, yes from the very beginning. Uh, yes in the sense of, yes, I want to be religious. Yes, I want to take vows. Yes, I want to serve you. Yes, I want to do whatever is given to me. No, you know, not, nothing extraordinary. Usually fill in jobs, you know, being a gardener to a cook or assistant to a cook, peeling potatoes, whatever is necessary, be a porter, uh, you know, open the doors for strangers who show up and, you know, they're usually begging for money or food or something else. Or, you know, you have a lot of people who are broken who show up at religious doors. You know, you never know who shows up, you know, because if you have a house, you say, well, I'm not letting anybody in. But if you're religious, you got to do something about it. You can't just say, go away, you know. So, so there she is filling in all the little jobs that she has to do. And she does it as just anybody else. Yeah, sometimes she's brighter, sometimes she's more prudent, sometimes she's able to do things better than everybody else does it. But above all, it's not what she's doing externally, but what she's doing inside of her heart is the ongoing dialogue with God, and the ongoing dialogue with Blessed Mother.